This is Gregory Michael, your host and moderator for Being Social, the weekly live on-air broadcast, not limited to radio waves, but accessible to millions of users around the globe via the internet or phone, where all that you need is a voice, a concern, and a longing to be heard for social causes. Join us this evening at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, starting now here in the States for Episode 7 of Being Social, as we explore the topic of America's role in foreign policy now. We'll take a look at the historical role that America has played as a world leader and how our nation fares now from a global perspective, as well as actions for greater responsibility. America also as a world leader and superpower. Why the U.S. has held the mantle of world leader for so long how being part of a global community has affected our role in the world, the IMF, International Monetary Fund, the State of the United Nations and its relevance, how the role of Secretary of State has changed or evolved. We'll also explore the women of state, Condoleezza Rice, Hillary Diane Rodham Clinton. What are the perceptions of our country as if we were to have a female president? As defined, the role of the Secretary of State is to organize and supervise the entire United States Department of State and the United States Foreign Service, advise the President on matters relating to U.S. foreign policy, including the appointment of diplomatic representatives to other nations and on the acceptance or dismissal of representatives from other nations, in addition to participate in high-level negotiations with other countries, either bilaterally or as part of an international conference. This includes the negotiation of international treaties and other agreements, as well as communicate issues relating to the United States foreign policy to Congress and to U.S. citizens. We'll also explore the U.S.'s history of leadership. Now, Jefferson was actually the first United States Secretary of State from 1790 to 93, serving under President George Washington, while U.S. Minister to France, the principal author of the Declaration of Independence in 1776, of course, and the third President of the United States from 1801 to 1809. Now, at the beginning of the American Revolution, Jefferson served the Continental Congress, representing Virginia, and then served as a wartime governor of Virginia from 1779 until 1781. Just after the war ended, from mid-1784, Jefferson served as a diplomat stationed in Paris. In May of 1785, he became the United States Minister to France. Let's look at Condoleezza Rice. Born November 14, 1954, is an American political scientist and diplomat. She served as the 66th United States Secretary of State and was the second person to hold that office in the administration of President George W. Bush. Rice was the first female African-American Secretary of State, as well as the second African-American after Colin Powell and the second woman after Madeleine Albright. Rice was President Bush's National Secretary Advisor during his first term, making her the first woman to serve in that position. Before joining the Bush administration, she was a professor of political science at Stanford University, where she served as provost from 1993 to 99. Ms. Rice also served on the National Security Council as the Soviet and Eastern Europe Affair, Affairs Advisor to President George H.W. Bush during the dissolution of the Soviet Union and German reunification. She's quite a busy lady. Following her confirmation as Secretary of State, Rice pioneered the policy of transformational diplomacy with a focus on democracy in the greater Middle East. Her emphasis on supporting democratically elected governments faced challenges as Hamas captured a popular majority in Palestinian elections and influential countries, including Saudi Arabia and Egypt, maintained authoritarian systems with U.S. support. While Secretary of State, she chaired the Millennium Challenge Corporation's Board of Directors. Hillary Diane Rodham Clinton Born October 26th of 1947, is an American politician and diplomat who was the 67th United States Secretary of State from 2009 to 2013, serving under President Barack Obama. She was previously a United States Senator for New York from 2001 to 2009. As the wife of President Bill Clinton, she was also the First Lady of the United States from 1993 to 2001. In the 2008 election, Clinton was a leading candidate for the Democratic presidential nomination. A native of Illinois, Hillary Rodham first attracted national attention in 1969 for her remarks as the first student commencement speaker at Wellesley College. 
She embarked on a career in law after receiving her J.D. from Yale Law School in 1973. Following a stint as a congressional legal counsel, she moved to Arkansas in 74 and married Bill Clinton in 1975. Named the first female partner at Rhodes Law Firm in 1979, she was twice listed as one, as one of 100 most influential law, lawyers in America. Pardon? As First Lady of Arkansas from 1979 to 81 and 83 to 1992 with husband Bill as governor, she successfully led a task force to reform Arkansas education system. During that time, she was a member of the board of directors of Walmart stores and several other corporations. Not exactly a feather in her cap, but quite the accomplished lady. Obama went on to win the election, of course, and appoint Clinton as Secretary of State. She became the first former First Lady to serve as in a presidential cabinet. She was the forefront of the U.S. response to the Arab Spring, including advocating the military intervention in Libya. Clinton introduced the Quadrennial Diplomacy and Development to review process to the State Department, seeking to maximize departmental effectiveness and promote the empowerment of women worldwide, and used smart power as a strategy for asserting the U.S. Um, Pardon me, U.S. leadership and values in the world. She became the most widely traveled Secretary of State during her time in office and championed the use of social media in getting the U.S. message out, which, of course, was a large part of the Obama campaign. Now, let's look at the world public opinion of the U.S. Most Americans believe majorities in Egypt and Libya did not support attacks. Uh, majorities of Americans say that the attacks against American embassies in Egypt and Libya in September 11th of 2012 were supported by extremist minorities, not by majorities of the population. In fact, 63% say that was more Egypt and 61% for Libya. However, Americans are dissatisfied with the response of Egypt and Libyan governments. Majorities say the government did not try to protect American diplomats and their staff. Uh, in fact, that's 53% felt that way, and even more for Libya at 63%, where the American ambassador Stevens was killed. Now, views of Arab people and Muslim people have not changed significantly. Views were even favorable and were evenly favorable, pardon me, and unfavorable a year ago. Majorities continue to say that it is possible for the West and the Muslim world to find common ground. 53% feel that way and to attribute the conflicts between Islam and the West to political rather than cultural or religious factors. In fact, 51% of Muslim population feel that way, but these majorities continue to decline uh, even from earlier this year. Now, as of July of last year, polls show support for tougher sanctions against Iran, but not for military force. In May of last year, majorities in 12 of 21 countries favored tougher international sanctions on Iran to try to stop it from developing nuclear weapons. Those countries included Germany, the United States, the Czech Republic, Britain, France and Italy, Spain, Mexico, Poland, Japan, Brazil, and Jordan at the lowest percentage against it at 52%. Uh, now, I believe, do we have a caller online who would like to chime in? Do you have, do we have someone who would like to uh, chime in with your opinion? Yeah, sure. Hi, hi, who's calling? Uh, this is Bruce from Miami. Hi, Bruce, how are you? How are you today? I'm good, thanks for joining in. Well, uh, what, do you, what do you believe foreign policy should be in the United States? Do you believe that we should be overseas, or do you think we should keep everything at home? Well, or is there a middle ground? Well, I think there needs to be a middle ground. I don't know if there is a middle ground. It's a very tough dilemma, of course. Um, I think that because, while America is still viewed as a superpower, I don't know how accurate that is. Um, it's a matter of, I guess, a matter of opinion, obviously, and a matter of factors. Um, but I believe that if you are going to be a world leader and hold that title, you do have an obligation. Um, so it's, it's finding a balance. I don't know how much. You know, America has been criticized for a long time for imposing its will on other countries um, for a long time. Um, I don't know. What, do you have an opinion on the matter? Well, I've, it's, it's just one of those problems that I think we've always faced in this country. Our history has been isolationist up until the 20th century, mm -hmm. uh, but we we are, but of course we have intervened in a lot of countries in the world uh, right there's there's been fewer we've been more times we've been involved in military conflicts than we haven't been involved mm -hmm. the majority of our history seems to be one of an interventionist country right uh we, you know we've intervened uh, numerous times in central and south america mm -hmm. and we have been intervened overseas as well 
Mm-hmm. Uh, it's not. It's like you said. It's not an easy and an, not an easy question to answer. Right. But we are the world's only superpower because no other no other military is as large as we are, or can project or can project their military force as fast as we can. Now, but tell me this: What about countries that don't want us involved? Well, that's that's a question that you know. Which countries are you referring to? I don't think any country wants another country involved right. in, uh, in, in other people's affairs. We're not even sure in this country if we want to be involved anymore. Yeah, well, it's, uh, it's a general question, but I know in the Middle East, there's still that feeling that they don't want America involvement. In the, you know, because it's not just a matter of the U.S. I think it's, it's, I was later in the topic, another subject that I'm going to touch on is the IMF and their role that they're playing, of course, in countries like Spain and Greece who, have, who are having dire economic problems and the IMF is coming in and their their roles have evolved over over decades where they're in order you know it's the give and take they're giving you monetary funding to help you balance your budget and to get your economy back on track but with that comes some restrictions that the countries have to abide by and a lot of countries uh some some of the countries are opposed to those things or the citizens at least don't like having you know their government submit to those policies um, well, uh, the, the, the thing that you shouldn't get confused on is foreign policy doesn't always involve military. Oh, no, but foreign I'm talking the IMF now. I'm talking the economy, not just military. Yeah, I, well, yeah. yeah, I think that's a good point that you make. But you also realize that foreign policy is whatever is the way you deal with other nations. It's not necessarily always hostile. Mm-hmm. It's oftentimes it's more peaceful than it is hostile. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of treaties with a lot of different countries that are benign. Or beneficial to us mm-hmm. they're not done at the point of a rifle they're right. done it through a mutually like nafta for instance mm-hmm. you know that's the north american free trade association uh, agreement and that is well there, i think it's been damaging to our country it's been beneficial to other countries mm-hmm. you know i mean there and then there's like the gat treaty which is a general agreement on tariffs and something mm-hmm. uh, and, and you know these are all part of foreign policy uh Foreign policy is whatever you make of it, and there is definitely positive aspects of foreign policy that benefit us and make us more secure, just as there's other parts of foreign policy that do not make us more secure. Right. And, yeah, and you know, and I think it's good that you tackle this subject. It's just, you know, what is foreign policy? How does it affect you? Well, and not just an individual, though, because we're not. We're a part of a global community now, and that's why I mm-hmm. wanted to touch on the topic, because everything that we do, is affecting other nations, whether it's at home or not. I mean, when the economy tanked in 2008, it didn't just affect us. Obviously, Europe is affected and many other countries. Uh, so it's, it's, it's the ripple effect, the butterfly effect. No matter what you do, somebody else is going to be affected by it. Yeah, no, no disagreement there. Yeah. But uh, no, the general thing is, is that foreign policy is, you know, how, how much, how tall do you want to build your fence? Mm. You know, do you want it? I mean, we're about to put up, if everything goes the way that people are saying it's going to go on our on our immigration, which is another topic, but also part of foreign policy, mm-hmm. we're now going to have a very large fence between us, uh, across us and the Mexican border. Yeah, that's good. Been... And wh- how do the Mexicans feel about that? And is it our foreign policy now? You know, that, it's the dialogue between countries and what our policy is, is as you elegantly pointed out in your opening one, is basically determined by the people who are in office. Right. Oh, it seems like we have another caller. Hold on. Uh, hi, do we have another caller joining us? Do we have another caller joining our conversation? Hello? Oh, uh, it seems you have another caller online. Um, welcome to the broadcast. You're welcome to chime in at any time. If you'd like to introduce yourself, you're welcome. We are talking about America's role in foreign policy. Would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, I'm not sure if he can hear us or... That's uh, the technology, I'm sure. <laughs> okay, but anyway, we'll continue. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's like we have a lot of different, uh, you know, foreign policies determined by the people in it, mm-hmm. and also the previous agreements agreed to. Right. So you know, that it's, you know, and it does affect us more so now than ever. But how much do we want things that occur in other countries to affect us in this country? How much do you feel comfortable by this? You know, and how foreign policy is used. Do you think it's fair or do you think it's an unfair way we use it? 
Well, it's a matter of, well, I think anytime there's power, there's got to be some checks and balances. And because of the way the world's changing, a lot of those regulations that have been in place are being modified to, or have to be modified to adjust to the changing times, like the role of the UN, the role of the IMF. They've all had to adjust uh, to the way that taxation is being, you know, formed by the economies, by the change of the financial systems, by our ecology, you know, all of that. We, we all... It, it all, all is going to affect us you know, globally, like I said, in all these different aspects. So, yeah, absolutely. I don't just think of foreign policy as military, though military is very significant. It's been one of the more significant components uh, for the last decade. It's definitely been at the forefront, um, especially with all the uprisings around the globe in the Middle East, here at home. You know, the, it's changed our lifestyle. The way that we live has changed our lifestyle. Which raises another interesting point to me. What can our foreign policy be with, say, a group that has no country or no government authority, yet we have to, we declare a war? All right. So we just had a, we had a caller in from Miami as well as one from Brazil. We had a little, a little <laughs> chatting in between as he's trying to uh, engage in the conversation. But we'll, I'll continue with our topic, America's role in foreign policy now. Um, it was, uh, thank you for the call from Miami. You really gave some good insight and challenging uh, questions. Of course, the lines will remain open for another 20 minutes for anyone who wants to engage in dialogue. Um, we're talking about uh, the polls being taken from other countries about uh, foreign policy and about the UN's role in government. Um, for example, a year ago, polls in the U.S. showed the majorities in both red and blue um, districts favored deep cuts in defense spending. Now, as our caller from Miami mentioned earlier, when talking about foreign policy, we're not only talking about uh, war or weapons, but that is a significant component. So that is a topic that I'll continue with, and we'll talk about some other aspects as well, the monetary, the IMF. A unique survey conducted by the Program for Public Consultation, the Stimson Center, and the Center for Public Integrity has found that substantial cuts to the defense budget are favored by majorities in both red and blue districts, as well as majorities in districts that benefit from high levels of defense spending, which I find quite quite surprising. In conducting the study, a representative sample of Americans was shown the 2012 defense budget from different perspectives and presented with arguments that experts make for and against cutting defense spending in 2013. Now, working online, they were then able to specify their preferred defense spending levels. Among those living in red districts or Republican states, 74% favored cutting defense. In blue districts, the Democratic states, 80% favored cuts. Uh, very marginal and not a great surprise for the Democrats, but the Republicans, that was quite surprising. August 2012, most Americans saw the Afghan war as not reducing the threat of terrorism. Though a majority of Americans, 59% in fact, in March of 2012, by a Gallup poll, still thought that going to war in Afghanistan was the right thing to do. Um, in December of 2011, a few years ago, polls found strong international consensus on human rights. Now, again, this is referring to the UN. Tenth, by December 10th of this year will be the 65th anniversary of, anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Updated digest of American and international public opinion reveal a remarkable degree of consensus on principles of human rights consistent with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, or UDHR. These digests have been developed by the Council on Foreign Relations, International Institutions, and Global Governance Program, and the Program on International Policy Attitudes. Now, they provide comprehensive analysis of international and U.S. polls on the world's most pressing challenges. Majorities in all nations polled, including those with authoritarian governments, endorse the principles that people should be free to express their opinions, including criticism of the government, People should have the right to demonstrate peacefully. The media should be free of government control. People should be treated equally irrespective of religion, gender, race, or ethnicity. Governments should be responsible for ensuring that their citizens can meet their basic needs for food, health care, and education. That includes large majorities of Americans. Uh, the will of the people should be the basis for the authority of government, and government leaders should be selected through free elections with universal suffrage. Th so those are a list of some universally accepted doctrine of the organization uh, that we were referring that we were referring to earlier. 
earlier. We still have our caller from Brazil online. I'm glad that he is getting some benefit out of this. Um, a more recent study conducted a year ago by the Pew in six major Muslim countries in the wake of the Arab Spring also shows majorities saying it is important that people can say what they think and can criticize the government, that people of all faiths can practice their religion freely and women uh, the same rights as men. Now, the International Monetary Fund, uh, you've probably, I'm sure that you're familiar with this fund, and Christine Lagarde is, is at its head, is an international organization that was initiated in 1944 at the Bretton Woods Conference and formally created in 1945 by 29 member countries. The IMF's stated goal was to assist in the reconstruction of the world's international payment system post-World War II. Now, countries contribute money to a pool through a quota system from which countries with payment imbalances can borrow funds temporarily. Through this activity and others such as surveillance of its members' economic uh, demands for self-correcting policies, the IMF works to improve the economies of the member countries. Now, the crucial role that Christine Lagarde and the IMF are playing now. The IMF is mandated to oversee the international monetary and financial system and monitor the economic and financial policies of its member countries. This activity is known as surveillance and facilitates the international cooperation. Since the demise of the Bretton Woods system of fixed exchange rates in the early 1970s, surveillance has evolved largely by way of changes in procedure rather, rather than through the adoption of new obligations. The responsibilities of the fund changed from those of guardian to those of overseer of members' policies. Now, criticism of the IMF. The IMF has been criticized for being out of touch with local economic conditions, cultures, and environments in the countries they are uh, requiring policy reform of. The fund knows very little about what public spending on programs like public health and education actually means, especially in African countries. They have no feel for the impact that their proposed national, national budgets will have on people. The economic advice the IMF gives might not always take into consideration the difference between what spending means on paper and how it is felt by citizens of the, of the country that it's donating funds to, or loaning funds to, rather. The recipient countries are sacrificing policy autonomy in exchange for the funds, which can lead to public resentment of the local leadership for accepting and enforcing the IMF conditions. Political instability can result from more leadership turnover as political leaders are replaced in electoral backlashes. IMF conditions are often criticized for their bias against economic growth and reduce government services, thus increasing unemployment. The IMF continues, continues advocating austerity programs, cutting public spending and increasing taxes, even when the economy is weak, in order to bring budgets closer to balance, thus reducing budget deficits. Now, Jeffrey Sachs argues in The End of Poverty, international institutes like the IMF and the World Bank have the brightest ec economists and the leading in advisors uh, for poor countries on how to break out of poverty. But, now here's the rub, the problem is the development economics needs the reform, not the IMF. He also notes that the IMF loan conditions need to be partnered with other reforms, such as trade, re trade reform in developed nations, debt cancellation, and increased financial assistance for investment in basic infrastructure in order to be effective. Now, the United Nations. The United Nations is an international organization whose stated aim includes promoting and facilitating cooperation in international law international security, economic development, social progress, human rights, civil rights, civil liberties, political freedoms, democracy, and the achievements of lasting world peace. Uh, the UN was founded in 1945, after World War II, to replace the League of Nations, to stop wars between countries, and to provide a platform for dialogue. It contains multiple subsidiary organizations to carry out its mission. At its founding, the UN had 51 member states. There are now 193. The organization has six principal organ organs, the General Assembly, the main deliberative assembly, the Security Council for deciding certain resolutions for peace and security, the Economic and Social Council for assisting promoting international economy and social cooperation and development, in addition the Secretariat for providing studies, information and facilities needed by the UN, the International Court of Justice, the primary judicial organ, and the United Nations Trustee Council, which is currently inactive. Other prominent UN systems agencies include the World Health Organization, more familiar perhaps, the World Food Program, and of course the 
United Nations Children's Fund, or UNICEF. The UN's most prominent position is that of the Office of Secretary General, which has been held by Ben Ki-moon of South Korea since 2007. The United Nations headquarters resides in international territory in New York City, with further main offices at Geneva, Nairobi, and Vienna. The organization is financed from assessed and voluntary contributions from its member states and has six official languages, Arabic, Chinese, English, French, Russian, and Spanish. Now, over the past decade, there has been increasing and continued displeasure with the function of the United Nations. Uh, for example, um, back in 2003, Americans on Iran and the UN inspections, uh, there was criticism uh, in March of 2005. Uh, a nation poll found strong support for dramatic changes at the UN. In 2007, Americans strongly supported the UN in principle, despite reservations about its performance. Uh, the world publics favor new powers for the UN in, in just 2007. Now, large majorities in all nations polled, on average, 7 out of 10, support the idea that the UN should make efforts to promote the human rights established in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. In nearly all countries, Majorities favor the UN increasing these efforts, and a similar number favor the idea of giving the UN power to go into countries to investigate human rights abuses, America being one of them. Uh, it seems we still have a caller with us. I'm glad you're still listening. Okay, now in 2008, however, people in Muslim nations were conflicted about the UN. For example, a poll of seven major Muslim nations that people... Find, found people conflicted about the United Nations. On one hand, there is widespread support for a more active UN with much broader powers than it has today. On the other hand, there is a perception that the UN is dominated by the US and there is dissatisfaction with UN performance on several fronts, particularly in dealing with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, there are <clears throat> the findings from a worldpublicopinion.org survey in Egypt, Turkey, Jordan, Iran, Indonesia, the Palestinian territories and Azerbaijan, uh, Muslims in Nigeria, 50% of the general population, were also polled. Asked about a number of options for giving the United Nations greater powers, nearly all received strong support. Now, publics in all nations polled favor the UN Security Council having its own standing peacekeeping force. On average, 64% support it, having the authority to go into countries to investigate human rights violations, averaging, and having the right to authorize military force to stop a country from supporting terrorist groups or to prevent severe human rights violations such as genocide, averaging 77% support. Now, publics in five out of six nations asked favor giving the United Nations its power to regulate the international arms trade, averaging 59%. Further, publics in all seven nations asked endorsed the controversial view that the UN has a responsibility to protect populations from severe human rights violations, even against the will of their own government. And that was a topic that we touched on earlier with our caller from Miami, was how much influence and at what point does a country, a superpower like the US, have the right or the authority to impose even its help, even when a nation doesn't want it, say if there's a corrupt government in place, uh, that's where the UN uh, comes in and is is uh, given that power or is up for, is asking for that power. Now, when Muslim publics are asked, would you like to see the UN do more, do less, or do about the same as it has been doing to promote human rights principles, majorities in six out of seven publics want the UN to do more, on average, 63%. The one area where the strong support splinters is on the idea of giving the UN the power to fund its activities by imposing a tax on such things as international sale of arms and oil. Now, if these and other topics are important to you, do join us on air by phoning in now at 562-645-3551. Uh, do us a favor. If you are calling in, please make sure that your television or stereo in the background is down because we're usually in the middle of a conversation and someone's speaking and your the volume is much louder coming through the Google Hangout speaker than you realize. But again, you can call in this evening or every Sunday evening at 7.30 p.m. at 562-645-3551 where I'll be standing by to engage engage with you on air. Join our Google Hangout here and share your input with friends by forwarding this recorded broadcast, which will be posted online later this week. Simply search for Podcast Being Social, Gregory Michael, the host, your host and moderator. That would be me, myself, and I. So you can join us each and every week via Google Hangout or phone or simply RSVP at eventbrite.com. 
where you'll see this broadcast as well as the remaining season's programming of which you are sure to find something of interest. And if not, and you have another topic of concern, don't hesitate to email us at admin at acclaimedtheatricals.com and uh, so let us know of your suggestion and perhaps we'll air your topic later this fall as part of season two. Now, if you missed last week's broadcast, episode six, High Speed Rail in America, to have or have not, you can listen or watch for free by going to acclaimtheatricals.com, gregorymichael.com, as well as YouTube or Vimeo, and they're all there for you absolutely free. Again, this program is distributed by Acclaimed Theatricals LLC, broadcast from Manhattan, free. It's without fees that we can be sure to provide our forum participants with an unbiased platform and are given one less reason not to take an active role as a concerned citizen. Now, while visiting our feeds, feel free to sign up for the monthly newsletter to stay up to date of not only this, but various other projects of Acclaimed Theatricals LLC and of my interest. Join us next Sunday, June 30th at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Being Social, the on-air live broadcast. Uh, for episode eight, we'll explore U.S. veterans are home now what? We'll take a look at the U.S. veterans that are coming home from recent wars over the last few years. What are the circumstances and conditions that they're facing? What are the challenges that they're facing? Are they getting their needs met? There was a lot of, of issues that were uh, their medical care and financial uh, liabilities were not being met, you know, as they left to serve their country and their families were here struggling financially. And when they come home, are they being given the assistance in finding jobs, employment that they need? So I'm hoping to have some U.S. veterans who may have recently come back from the Middle East or from wars who would like to come on air and give voice to their concerns. Um, what challenges are they facing as they try to acclimate back in the States? There are free tickets available on eventbrite.com. Um, you are welcome to join us. I'll keep the line open for another 10 or so minutes, 10 till 9. Uh, so the line will remain open if you have an opinion, if you'd like to chime in. We've had two callers chime in tonight. We're happy to have you. Uh, you are more than welcome to give us feedback on America's role in foreign policy, on the state of the UN, on the IMF. Uh, so this is Gregory Michael, your host. And again, I'll keep the line open. You're welcome to join us. Well, I'm glad that you joined in, Mark. Next time, don't be so shy and don't be afraid to come on audio. Uh, you don't have to show a photo, of course, as you see, you're using screen share. Uh, so that was Mark Stuckles. He was calling from Canada. Uh, he came in um, in the latter part of the, conversa latter part of the conversation. He uh, did not do audio chat. He, um, he just left the conversation, but I'm glad that people are getting involved and coming on. We have three callers <laughs> who uh, came on tonight. Very different. One from Brazil, one from Canada, one from Miami. That's very diverse. It's about as diverse as you want to get when it comes to foreign relations. Um, so anyway, as I was saying, uh, next Sunday, do join us, uh, June 30th at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time for Being Social, Episode 8. We'll, we'll explore the U.S. veterans uh, that are home now from the recent wars and what they're dealing with. Um, so we'll have other callers come on and don't be afraid you, it's a little more difficult when you call, when you listen and you chat because I'm, I'm engaging in dialogue and discussion. So it's a little awkward. So it'd be great if you could actually do audio, rather you want to do it by phone or if you just want to come on and do a screen share, you don't have to show your photo. Um, nothing highly sensitive or secretive about this conversation. Uh, so you can go to eventbrite.com and you look for podcast being social. Look for my name, Gregory Michael. You'll see a list of the full season's broadcast. Um, we have five more episodes to go. And, um, and then we'll start with season two's, uh, season two's broadcast. Looks like we have someone else joining our hangout. Um, hola. <laughs> we have our friend from Brazil again, it seems. Uh, so you are more than welcome. Again, we'll keep the line open for 10 more minutes in case anyone has any more insight or questions that they'd like to add. Do we have another caller online? Okay, so we still have um, someone <laughs> chiming in. This is a very interesting topic. It's funny. Um, people are coming in, but they're very timid about getting in. Now, my friend, the friend from Brazil is not timid. He certainly is not. He just doesn't speak English. Uh, so that's interesting. Uh, FYI, if you are calling from another country and you'd like to listen in your language, uh, once this is posted on YouTube, if you look below the video, you can try, it will automatically transcribe it to various languages. So you'll be able to watch the uh, transcription in your own language. It will transcribe the English uh, audio portion that you're hearing here to your own language. So uh, like our friend from Brazil, you'll be able to check it out in a few days. It'll be online at YouTube as well as Vimeo. So you can listen to our earlier callers from Miami and uh, our friend from Brazil um, and our friend who, who sent a little, a few, a short text message from 
uh, via chat. So you do have some options as to how you'd like to communicate, whether it's via Google Hangout and just logging on. You don't have to do a, you can do a screen share if you don't want your photo up, or you can call in at 562-645-3551 uh, to uh, via phone if you're not at a computer. So there we go. You have, have a lot of options to get involved. Uh, so again, I'll keep the line open for five more minutes and then we will have this up for you online so that you can go and listen at your leisure and share with friends um, to share your opinion. And you can always email. I'm always willing to revisit a topic um, and have more callers come back online to discuss uh, the various issues that we talked about tonight. Um, I enjoy doing this because it's nice to be able to to get a consensus of the of the public and not only here in the states but also of other countries like Brazil and like Canada what are their perceptions of the US uh, what are the, what are their perceptions of our roles around the world in politics uh, what do they think of the UN and its function the IMF you know I think uh, one thing I, I learned from doing this I always learn something in my research and I find that you know it's true what they say you can't know where you're going until you understand your history and that's one thing that I love about doing this is that in doing my research, I learned a lot of things about American history that I did not know. I did not know that Jefferson was actually the first uh, Secretary of State, as the, even though he was serving as minister in France. That's how the, the role, the title um, came about. And that's very interesting and very enlightening to me. So I always find that's one thing I love about doing this sort of thing. And it's, I think that's what attracted me to acting as well, is that it's a never-ending learning curve. I love learning about history. And the funny thing is I didn't learn love it in school. Like you, I, I avoided it at all cost American history. I thought it was utterly boring. But I enjoy, now that I'm, I'm an adult, I find that researching it and reading for myself and not believing everything um, that I see or hear on t in, in, uh, in traditional media, um, but I, I enjoy discovering for myself. There are a lot of resources out there that you can do your own research um, to educate yourself and enlighten yourself and broaden your mind. So, again, this is Gregory Michael, your host and moderator for Being Social. Again, next week's topic is the U.S. Veterans Are Home. Now what? Uh, do join us this time next Sunday at 7.30 Eastern Standard Time here in the States.